Okay. Thank you so much, Shelby, for joining me. I've been soaking up so much um, from being in your spaces over the last few years. And that's really enriched my own experience in my own body, first and foremost, as well as the way that I am in relationship with my clients and so many other people in my life. And it's a really a pleasure to have you here. Mm, thank you. I noticed as you were talking, I just naturally started kind of rocking back and forth. <laughs> and felt really sweet to hear. Mm. So I would love to talk with you today about so we talk a lot as in our field and we hear a lot even in, in yoga and things like that. Um, get out of your head and into your body. And I talk about embodiment a lot and, and the wisdom of your body. But often when it doesn't feel like the body is always wise, especially when it's not doing what you want it to do. And I'm thinking of... Um, people who, who have maybe things like strong anxiety or panic attacks or challenges with infertility or other health challenges or um, not having a hard time accessing the kind of pleasure that they want to. And it's like, you really want something and your body is just like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't always, it's hard to understand sometimes in those situations how how is my body being wise in this moment? This sucks. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. It's such a good topic, especially for me, because I am one of those people that like, I work in this field surrounded by pleasure junkies <laughs> <laughs> and, and people who, you know, teach about ease and pleasure and like the sacredness of the body and the wisdom of the body. And, you know, it will be a lifelong work for me to mm. really be able to trust the experience of my body. Mm. It's a daily, daily practice. And it's been, I feel like I've been at war with mm. so many things about my body for so long. Yet I know from experience, you know, even just this much more embodied or this much more that it gives me so much back that I didn't have before. And um, so I'm excited for this conversation because I think it's, I think there are a lot of people out there similar to me, like, yeah, stop talking to me about pleasure and ease. Like, <laughs> I just like to have a day where I don't, I'm not in like a lot of pain or struggle or in a fight with this whole deal. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And there's a beautiful permission slip in there to like, never have to reach the end where you are completely at peace to let it be a practice. And I think it's, um, I think it's a quote from Rilke where he talks about living the questions. Mm. And I really, I love to kind of feel into that a lot. Like this is a question that, you know, as a recovering perfectionist, I don't have to, I don't have to like perfectly embody this or perfectly know the answer to this question. It's a question that I can live and kind of, set that intention and see what happens as I move towards it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, there were so many years where I thought there was an end point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember when I first started practicing meditation and Buddhism a long time ago, just, you know, going to sit on a hill in the middle of the night and just sitting down and staying as long as I could, just thinking if I could find the freedom that this practice promises me, everything would be better everything mm -hmm. like everything would change completely and you know striving for this like perfect enlightenment or embodiment to me that's the same thing yeah <laughs> um really creates just so much added stress because what i found over time is we have these peak experiences. I think I was just talking about this on another live thing mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. where, you know, we're filled with pleasure and joy and ecstasy and connection. And we can feel in every cell of our bodies. And then we like hang on to it, thinking that every other moment that doesn't feel like that, there's something wrong. I mean, I do that. <laughs> I yeah. don't know if everyone does that. 
Yeah. But it's in that clinging that creates so much unnecessary stress. And so when we can let it be a practice and an unfolding and an ebb and flow, we give ourselves so much more permission to be a human being mm-hmm. because we couldn't possibly live in those states all the time. Well, I don't know. I hear there are some people that have, but <laughs> I certainly am nowhere near that. <laughs> no, no, me either. Yeah. And it, what about even, you? Is that, is that your experience with it too? Oh, yeah. As, as I, um, as I was hearing you describe running up the hill to meditate and like, if I could just get this, I feel, I feel like my arms squeezing in and and things get tight and I'm like, just try it so much. It just feels like trying so hard all the time. Yeah. That feels like exhausting. Um, but yeah, that is, that's very much my experience too, that if, um, especially in, in the world of, of pleasure and, and sexuality that I've been immersed in, if I have an experience and then I go back to feeling like I can't access the kind of pleasure that I want or um, whatever, that there's something wrong with me and that I'm doing it wrong. Is that feeling like I'm, or I'm failing or I'm getting it wrong somehow? Um, yeah especially knowing that I was able to do it before. So why can't I do it now? I should, I know how, I know how to do this. I know what the tools are. Yeah. I can really easily get caught in that spiral of comparing, thinking other people can do it. So why can't I, I have this whole fantasy about how other people are doing things, but it's probably not actually true. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Would you like to share a little bit about um, your experiences with your body and feeling like, so that the word that's been coming to me around this is betrayal. Like the feeling sometimes that our bodies are betraying us, that they're doing things outside of our control that really don't feel good or that even break our hearts or that there's something kind of deeply wrong with them. And I'm wondering if you'd like to share a little bit about what that's been like in your life. Yeah. I mean, uh, so many different kinds of instances Mm. pop into my mind, you know, Mm. uh, my, I have this story that I would be more connected to the divine Mm -hmm. if I was more able, more embodied, more of the time, the amount of times Mm -hmm. I've like sent up prayers and then that thing didn't happen. (laughs) Mm. So there's like a betrayal in that way of like, God, if only I could listen the way that I think I should be able to, to, to this Mm. divine sacred connection or Mm. um, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was struggling with orthorexia for so long, which is an eating Mm -hmm. disorder that more and more people are knowing about. um, But it's just a constant, like, the body is not processing the food the way you want it to. There's all this fear around the relationship to food, having it be Mm. this way or that. And it's, you just, for me, I so wanted health and instead I was Mm. suffering with trying to control it through food and thinking that this was the way, like if I could just get my body healthy enough through this perfect way of eating um, mm-hmm. then I would feel better Then my immune system would work better Then I would yeah. this, this or that. And it's like, no matter how restricted I got, it, my body would not perform the way I wanted it to. Mm-hmm. And I felt like mm-hmm. rage that I couldn't control it mm-hmm. and that it wouldn't cooperate with what I wanted all the mm-hmm. time. And mm-hmm. I feel really sad saying that, you know, mm-hmm. that this basic mm-hmm. need of nourishment turns into a war with the body because Mm. of these ideas we have and any, you know, any reason why we would do that. There's so many. Yeah. So that came to mind and yeah, I mean, you name it. Yeah. (laughs) The anxiety, the panic, the, you had mentioned infertility earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So much. I, I think the biggest one for me, I mean, it's, it's related to the orthorexia, but the body image stuff, for so maybe in my entire life it's like I cannot get this body to do what I want it to do to look the way I want it to do 
look, mm -hmm. perform the way I know it used to perform or could perform because of all the pain. And so <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm like, I have heat rising in me as I'm talking yeah. about this. Yeah. 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 And that when I hear you describe it, it, it just reminds me of just countless conversations over my life, these same kinds of things that we hear over and over and over, especially amongst um, those of us who are socialized as women, mm -hmm. the expectations on how our bodies should look and how they should perform the messages that we get around that from such a young age. I don't, th I, th I can't think of one woman I know who's not been affected by that in some way. So many who are really constantly, um, it, it occupies a lot of real estate in our minds, in our energy. So much. And I catch mm. myself all the time when I'm interacting with little girls too, mm. where I want to comment on their appearance. I'm like, oh, yes. isn't that pretty? Isn't that so cute? Yes. And boys were so conditioned to talk about like their performance and yes. what they're doing, you know? Yes. And I'm like, wow, I do that. I still do that. And yeah. this, is, this is the product of some of that. And how is it that we all still carry this conditioning so deeply? Yeah, yeah. But there's, as I hear you say that too, I think there's compassion for it too, because it goes so deep and it has been the water we've been swimming in our whole lives, the air we've been breathing, at least in the, the cultures that we live in, in the US and Australia and similar places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Compassion. That's one thing I really appreciate about you. You're really <laughs> good at bringing that in. <laughs> And I think there's something to, to, and this, of course, this is something that's very much at the center of, of your work, but in holding things together and not having to hold them alone and being able to There's some, it feels different to feel like I'm alone. I'm the only one who feels this way. I'm alone in this and I have to figure it out myself versus being able to speak it out loud and have other people go, oh yeah, I get that. And I hear you. Yeah. That in and of itself is so supportive. That has been the number one most healing thing for me is mm -hmm. healing in connection, you know, being mm -hmm. able to be vulnerable about these really, really tender things that, you know, I tell myself, you're better, you're better than this. You, you know how to treat mm. this. You treat this every day. Yes. <laughs> yes. And like all of the ways that I, I hide from myself even, and being mm -hmm. able to have somebody or some people that I can be like, I don't, I don't have this, you know, I, mm. I need support. And, mm. um, I have tried, I've tried to meditate it away. I've tried to breath work th these <laughs> things, away, you know, and those things all help. But for me, the connection has been the thing because what I believe is that, you know, all of these for me are trauma responses really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the fastest way to exacerbate a trauma response is shame. Mm -hmm. And the quickest way to heal it is connection, mm -hmm. connection in relationship and connection to ourselves. Yeah. And when I was trying to kind of be hiding it from myself or others yeah. and do all my practices by myself, just yeah. trying to get through it so that nobody would find out <laughs> whatever that was, that mm. was so mm. hard to share. Now it doesn't feel mm. hard at all. Mm -hmm. When I was able to out that to somebody that felt safe enough to share with, mm. everything started changing for me. Not that it's totally changed, <laughs> but... Mm -hmm. There was a lot more space to be yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? Mm. And which, which aspect? In, well, I mean, I've been curious all the way back to the betrayal question of yeah. what themes have come up for you around betrayal and what has been the thing that's supported the healing of that? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I definitely, I remember, especially around like high school and college or university that age, not, you know, not really loving everything about my body, like my, and the, the irony is that that's probably like when I was in high school, I was running cross country and track and I was probably in like the best physical shape of my life. <laughs> I don't run anymore. <laughs> but, um, and the, the, during those times feeling like my thighs were too big and I don't like my stomach and like I would always wear board shorts at the beach and hating my boobs I always thought they were too small and my mom would and, and I felt like I was too short and my mom would tell me sometimes girls get growth spurts at this age or at that age and that age came and went and my boobs were still small and I was still short I, you know eventually realized it was just going to be like that but that that just there's a bit of like grief and sadness there that I went through so much time in a body where there's nothing wrong with it, but I still felt like there was something not lovable about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But probably the most um, significant experience for me was really probably more around my sexuality. Like for, because I grew up, um, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but grew up, religious with a lot of beliefs around masturbation is wrong and bad sex before marriage is wrong and bad and even to feel like turned on or attracted to someone like that even that was was sinful mm. it was very much like the the kind of natural things that were happening in my body as I went through puberty and started to um, get older, the natural kind of impulses that were arising were wrong. And so there was a sense that I couldn't trust my body, like my body's um, kind of natural instincts and impulses could be bad and couldn't be trusted. Mm. That I could actually like go to hell for them. And it, it goes back, even this idea I think back now on this idea of original sin, which is, I and the, the tradition that I grew up in was Catholicism, so it may be different in other traditions, but that the idea that humans are kind of innately sinful. Hmm. And even just that belief now breaks my heart. Yeah. Because I do, and humans, of course, are capable of horrendous things, but I don't believe that we're, innately wrong or bad um but how that kind of played out in my life was that even once I changed my mind about um whether you know sexual expression and enjoying my sexuality what kind you know I didn't believe anymore that it had to be in one marriage between a man and a woman but my body still would shut down like I couldn't access, it was like hard to orgasm. I couldn't access pleasure or like I would feel guilty or I, I went through phases of like I would, um, I would self-pleasure and then I would feel really bad about it and really wrong and try to stop. And then I would try it again. And it was just this kind of almost like a, a push-pull, like grappling and fighting with what was my, my, like my natural enjoyment of my own body and like the erotic life force moving through me. Um, mm. And so when my bot, when I would want to engage sexually, whether it was with myself or someone else and my body wouldn't respond the way that I would want it to, or I would feel numb or it would shut down. Um, I would feel really disappointed or like there was something wrong with me or like it just wasn't cooperating yeah. and and resent my body for that hmm. wow mm -hmm. it sounds like those all came from the messages that you were taught you know mm -hmm. it's so unfortunate mm -hmm. and when I I'm I'm the oldest child and I re I remember when I was younger 
even I, I cared so much about following the rules. I was, I would like to hear the cockatoos. No, no, there's some really loud birds in the background. I always pay attention to when they, they chime in. <laughs> <laughs> um, they actually, they, they're very loud and squawky and they remind me to use my voice boldly and not be, not be afraid of being too sweet all the time. I like that. I'm going to remember that when my puppy is barking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about your social niceties. I'm hungry. <laughs> I want to tell you about the bird outside. <laughs> I've had a lot of good practice with that in the last few days, for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and that it that it it's funny, isn't it? Like the her just her natural instinct of of how to respond to things and how to use her voice as as a dog, without the the rules of like when you should be nice and quiet and when you should, when you're allowed to express yourself and in what ways, like what a freedom she has. <laughs> yeah, probably. I'm probably dampening it a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what, um, what train I was on when the cockatoo and then my mind went out the window to the cockatoos. Um, we were talking about the conditioning um, that causes the betrayal. Oh, I cared. I cared so much about following the rules. I would like yeah. research. I, I, I would take in every signal about the, I was so attuned to what, what people didn't, didn't want me to do. My parents, my teachers, the priests, the Sunday school, the like, I was always looking for, tell me what's right and wrong. So I don't do the wrong thing. And very much looking outside myself for that. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, in a way that makes me interested in what's actually happening when our bodies quote unquote betray us. Yeah. And instead of making it wrong or bad, it, it makes me think, gosh, we are, we are such an intelligent mm. organisms that mm -hmm. all of these body signals would come up and let us know like, oh, something got missed here. Something's off. Something, there's a need here that's not getting met. Mm -hmm. There's a desire that's not getting met or mm -hmm. something. There's some information here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I know I used to get really alarmed <laughs> when my body was betraying me and <clears throat> now I get really curious yeah because by now it's happened enough times that I'm like oh I'm not getting nourished in some way here mm -hmm. whether it's from myself or from someone else or life and it's just really important to listen in which was something mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do that wasn't something I was taught to do mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful that that's an option now yeah yeah it's like learning your body's language, isn't it? Because it doesn't always, it's not, it doesn't like send you an email and say like, <laughs> this is the kind of love, safety and belonging I need in order to feel safe and perform how you want me to. Totally. Yeah. We were talking about fertility for a second and I, I was just kind of thinking um, there were several years, like right in what I thought were the most important years, um, where I was told I couldn't have children mm. and I was just overwhelmed with grief because mm. I felt like I was still a teenager. I hadn't healed as much as I wanted to heal yet. I didn't feel like I was really ready to be a mom, but I knew I wanted to be a mom. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm just, back then there's no way I would have been like, what's my body telling me that's, yeah. that's yeah. important? What can I get really curious about now? I was just yeah. pissed. I yeah. was pissed at all the people who caused the trauma. I was pissed mm -hmm. at how long it was taking to feel better. I was pissed at the mm -hmm. doctor for being an idiot. I was pissed, mm -hmm. I was pissed and I was mm -hmm. so sad. Mm -hmm. um, 
but these days, if I was to really kind of check in, I think that my body was just saying like, I need more time, mm. <laughs> I need more care, more connection, more support, mm-hmm. um, which is what I got. And now my fertility is great. You mm-hmm. know? <laughs> apparently mm. according to all the tests that all were really not good before yeah and uh, what's happened between then and now is like oh I've learned how to listen a little better I've learned how to yeah. take care of those things that I hear and honor them yeah. and move more slowly and mm. uh, actually connect with my body mm. Mm. yeah mm. Yeah. So that makes me, makes me curious to hear more about how that happened. But I also feel like hearing you say that you were really pissed and overwhelmed with grief, like the anger and the grief also are important messengers in their own right. And they, they're very, they make sense. Yeah. Just as you said that, I just got that (laughs) because it was coming out of your mouth. I was like, and that's, the wisdom too was like I was never allowed to feel anger and Mm -hmm. like this was one of those things that I had to feel it about you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) that Mm -hmm. what happens is my body my body has ramped up so much because I had learned to shut it down so much that it's like it will be waving the red flags and then like it's like so far beyond the red flags (laughs) that then I'm paying attention (laughs) Mm -hmm you know, Mm -hmm. way beyond that window of tolerance we talked about. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you going to pay attention now? Like you just like, I was diagnosed with cancer at one point. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you going to fucking slow down? Mm -hmm. Like you have to tend to some of these things inside. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, actually feeling the grief and feeling the anger, Mm -hmm. being in connection, doing that, learning practices of how to let it move through in healthy ways. Mm-hmm. That has been the opposite of that betrayal situation. That has yeah. been connection and trust and building that. And a lot of good things come out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Life feels more full and expansive and vibrant. And I am certainly not there all the time, but much more there than I ever was before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You also said before, it feels like there's a lot more space. And yeah. just that feeling of spaciousness feels really good in my own body. Like I, I, my body wants to just go like, <sighs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, around the fertility conversation, I don't feel like I have that much space. There mm. is stress that I manage mm. daily around, you know, I'm, I'll be 40 here in just like a month or two. And mm-hmm. you know what happens when, yeah. 40 comes, you know, and that, I mean, what happens is just like the internal stories. There's so much time I know. Um, but the stories and the stress, so it's just another invitation to go, okay, what's happening in here. Um, my impulse is always to go to alarm and shame Mm -hmm. and try Mm -hmm. to fix it and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that with this one. Yeah. 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 So you were saying before, in, in terms of for people who really are in that, right in that place where it feels like their body is betraying them and not doing what they want it to do and they can't get there. Where do you start? Mm. Or where do you start when it when it comes up for you? Yeah. So right before we started the call, you guided us through a practice and you were like, is there a particular place in your body that might have some wisdom for this call? And Mm. I was kind of like listening in here in my heart and, and it just said, just like slow down. You can always slow down. Mm -hmm. And that for me, it's really hard. I slowing, I don't like slowing down. (laughs) There's a lot to feel when we slow down. So I'd rather go fast. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And so the slowing down, it gives a little space and 
right away I even notice as I feel into that into the betrayal it's like oh yeah there is grief there yeah there's like it's really tender it's really vulnerable it's pretty Mm -hmm. raw Mm -hmm. and that's where I start it's like what in the slowing down there's space to just go what's here Mm -hmm. and first I tend to feel the emotions and then I go oh yeah I can feel it all through the center of my body Mm -hmm up my back, down my front. And Mm -hmm. oh yeah, right there in my gut. It's like, as soon as I start tuning in, it's like, and then there's something else and something else. Yeah. But the first part would be doing whatever I can to slow down, which is honestly really hard to do when I'm not with another person. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So (laughs) find a person and then slow down. For anyone listening, like really take it in that even the professionals <laughs> need, even, even when, so I've been talking to other people about this lately too, because often we feel like I have the tools, I know what to do, I should be able to do this myself. But there really is something about being with someone else and having someone else support you that makes things so much more accessible and it makes it possible in ways that are, it's for whatever reason, when you're by yourself, sometimes you just can't quite get yourself there. And I, I was, I've been reflecting too on how it's not a, um, it's literally how we're designed as human beings. Like we evolved as social creatures meant to be in connection. So it's not like a, there's a, a message. It's a quite a strong message in our culture of like, you should be able to do this yourself and all that. But it's not like a design flaw that we need support. It's actually a design feature. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I as you know, you know, I think about trauma a lot because that's what Mm -hmm. I teach about. And um, most of the people who are my clients come to me for some kind of support around the trauma they've been through. And I think about developmental trauma and I think about what's supposed to happen in a healthy relationship between a, a baby and its caregivers or caregiver or parent or parents. And, um, they learn how to feel their feelings through the the support, through the eyes of the parents' reflection. You know, they don't actually have any clue what's happening in there until they Mm. look at the face of their caregiver, Mm -hmm. until they hear the sounds like, oh, is that a sad sound? Is that an angry sound? You know, it's because it's mirrored back to them that they know what they're feeling. That's how development happens. Mm -hmm. And so those of us who didn't get consistent, dependable, accurate, somatic, I would also add somatic reflection around like, oh, you're feeling really sad. It's heavy in your heart or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're still like, when we're left to our own devices, it's just like, just give me Netflix, you know, or whatever. that wasn't something that we got mapped into our systems or in our mm-hmm. brains. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me these days, I have all the compassion in the world and I'm like, literally I I'd, I'd rather do Netflix than try to do this on my own. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm going on a walk with a friend tomorrow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because I I'm so aware that I can go there, even if someone's not physically or literally supporting me, just if they're near me. Mm -hmm. I feel safe enough to feel myself internally. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And I I also um, talk to people sometimes and they, they feel like no way am I going there to feel that because if I feel that everything's going to explode, it's just too big. It's like a landmine will go off. If I actually, I, it's like not an option to go there. Um, what kind of I don't know, advice isn't quite the right word, but what do you have to say about when it feels that big and bottled up inside? Yeah, I mean, 
if that person was sitting right in front of me, I would just say, of course, it makes absolute (laughs) sense that you feel that way. Mm -hmm. Like, how could you not? Mm -hmm. Um, so just to first really like validate each other and ourselves, oh, it feels like there could be a landmine here. Yeah. So not needing to push and be like, no, let's just, let's just do it anyways. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, there might be something here that's really tender, really scary, really vulnerable. And I'm going to be right here with you. So whether that's you talking to yourself, like the adult wise part of yourself, um, talking to those more scared parts, or it's another, if you're being with a person, it's like, okay, let's do this together. And little by little, Mm -hmm. just like, let, can we just like sit near the landmine for a while and like have a picnic? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's do that for a week or two. And then mm-hmm. like, oh, is there something that kind of feels like it wants our attention? Just mm-hmm. one thing. And then mm-hmm. can we be with that with lots of slowness and curiosity and mm-hmm. also a resource? So that's like mm-hmm. us being together. That's really supportive. That's like a resource. What's supportive? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what can we lean into? Or there's so many resources, you know, can I just put my hand on your back or can you put your feet on the floor or is there anything around you that's really comforting to look Mm -hmm. at? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine a peaceful place? Mm -hmm. All sorts of resources, especially if it's a landmine situation. Yeah. I really recommend putting a thousand resources in the toolbox first, because then when we Mm -hmm. get overwhelmed, we go, oh, we have resources too. And so we can go back and forth between what feels overwhelming and then resource. And uh, for me, I would be like, wow, that takes too long. You know, still, anytime <laughs> my therapist want, tries resourcing me when we start rolling up our sleeves, I get so <laughs> mad. I'm like, I'm a professional. <laughs> I can see what you're doing. Yeah, I can handle this. <laughs> and it's, it, the work happens so much faster but it's so counterintuitive. Mm. It's like, no, mm. let's get in there right now so we can rip the bandaid off, see the thing, put the door back on, you know, mm-hmm. done. And it's like, well, what experience has shown me for my own nervous system and working with a lot of people is that while it's, I, it makes so much sense why it would seem good to just rip the bandaid off and mm-hmm. roll up our sleeves, just slowly, slowly building trust and having support and moving towards these things and embracing them with every bit of our hearts that we can is the deepest healing I have ever known. Mm. 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 (laughs) I don't know. How would you respond to that question? If you were encountering a landmine with a client or yourself? I mean, I've learned a lot from you, so I would say a lot of the same things. <laughs> but I didn't hear it enough. <laughs> I yeah, like I think, like you said, you don't have to like go in and devour the landmine all at once. You can um, take it bit by bit. Um, I thought of this analogy the other day and it's not a perfect analogy for multiple reasons but I'm going to share it because I think it's funny um in terms of of taking it slowly and bit by bit it's kind of like if you're in a room full of people and you're really gassy and you have to fart you don't just like let it all out (laughs) one big loud smelly one you kind of go like little (laughs) (laughs) So like take it in little little puffs and let it disperse so that you don't um, cause a big disturbance in the whole room. <laughs> but that I mean I it's bad analogy. analogy. <laughs> yeah. I mean it makes it sound like you know your feelings are offensive like a fart, which is not true. But um I thought it was funny when I thought of it. (laughs) I like it. I think it's actually a really great metaphor. (laughs) 
I was thinking, you know, a lot of people would express that, you know, it feels like a landmine and others might feel like it just feels like a brick wall. Like there is Mm -hmm. no getting in there. I am inside my fortress. Um, but like, I I don't even want to figure out how to pull those bricks down, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of time, what we'll do is we'll just say, Hey, what would it be like to put a hand on that wall? Mm-hmm. Inst- instead of even starting to think about pulling bricks down like that start mm-hmm. that feels violent to my system mm-hmm. what if we just put a hand on the wall and there is so much information that happens when people do that and it's enough to process the whole thing usually mm-hmm. it there's just it's just amazing what the body is capable of when we can slow down enough to be with it in a really respectful non-pushy gentle way which is hard for a lot of us who have a hard time being with our bodies because most of us are used to intensity Mm -hmm. and just kind of like beating our bodies up pretty good you know just like Mm -hmm. using it as a some people like call it a meat sack you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without not realizing it is full of intelligence and emotions and also aliveness and pleasure and all of these things we don't real until we realize it we just kind of just use it Mm, yeah and I heard you say the word intelligence I thought oh I want to come back to that because when so to use my example when my body was shutting down around pleasure it that doesn't feel intelligent it feels frustrating but the in my experience, in my own body, the intelligence behind that was this actually really doesn't feel safe. Like if I, if I express my pleasure and my sexuality in this, in this direction that I'm heading in this way that I'm trying to, I might go to hell. I might be, um, I might not belong in my community anymore. I might, you know, really bad things will happen. And so it was telling me that that my body needed to learn that it was beautiful and that it was safe and that it was okay. And it was really just alerting me to, it was trying to protect me in a sense. Yes, exactly. Mm. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that. It's so important our bodies are so intelligent. (laughs) Mm -hmm. My view is that every communication, like they are always trying to take care of us in some way or keep Mm -hmm. us safe or protect us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like a little misguided. Yes. Um, But the intention is almost always to keep you alive, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a beauty to that too, because it often it feels like these things that happen in our bodies, whether it's like panic attacks or not being able to feel pleasure or infertility or, or illness, they feel like, um, like they're, they're kind of shutting down life in a way they're getting in the way of life. But Mm. when I hear you say it that way, I can feel how there's a, that, that, um, impulse for protection is actually trying to keep you alive. It's trying, it's, it's in, it's meant to be, even if it is misguided, it's meant to be in the service of life. And I think there's a real beauty to that. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. It totally does feel like it's getting in the way of life so much when Mm -hmm. that betrayal Mm -hmm. is up and when we can orient towards it going, okay, how, how would it make sense that this is happening right now? that it's mm-hmm. trying to help me. So mm-hmm. many possibilities open up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we were talking before about how kind of, we've been talking about the processes and the ways that we can feel what our body needs us to feel and and process what we need to process and move towards it instead of away from it and how connection is a really important part of that. So I'd love to talk a little bit about when connection feels, even 
even with practice, it still feels hard to reach out and ask for help sometimes or to get support or um, sometimes connection feels like nobody's going to want to connect with me. Nobody's going to want to talk to me. Or I do this, I do this like math in my head. That's like, well, I, um, you know, I helped that person two times and they helped me two times. So like, I can't ask them to help me a third time because then it's not, it's not fair. It's not even, I'm asking for too much. Um, so when we have all of these kind of it's not, it's basically, it's not just as simple as going, yes, I will connect now. Let me press the connect button. <laughs> so how can we, all. how can we, yeah. How can we move towards connection with others and with people who have the capacity to, to be with us? Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because I think we did make it sound like a little, like it's so easy just call a friend <laughs> or have someone nearby and and you mentioned, you know, maybe that person doesn't want to do that or doesn't have the capacity. And something I'll do is be like, yeah, it'd be great to be around someone, but I don't know anyone that I want to be around, you know, yeah, it's the other yeah. way for me. And yeah. usually what that's about for me is that I am, I believe nobody could handle me in that state mm -hmm. or will want to continue to be my friend, seeing me mm -hmm. so authentic and raw and vulnerable, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. my own stuff. Remind me, I want to talk about body memories too. Um, <laughs> that just came in. Um, I would say to just keep holding that in our hearts and see which parts of us are open to the possibility of moving towards connection. And to so start letting in the little moments of connection mm -hmm. that are sweet, even when we're not needing it, mm -hmm. to start going, oh, you know, I actually really enjoyed that, or that was that felt really good to my system. I felt safe with that person. I felt mm -hmm. held by that person. I enjoyed holding that person. And I felt mm -hmm. like myself around that person, even if it's just a minute or two and to start letting our systems register. Oh, being in connection can feel okay or mm -hmm. even better. Um, if you're somebody who it's like, whoa, connection feels like the last thing I would do. <laughs> mm -hmm to help process some of this stuff. And I was absolutely that person for a long time. So just letting it in little by little. And I would say you can start with a pet really. Mm, <laughs> really yeah. feel that co-regulation with an animal. It can be the yeah. sweetest thing in the world to feel loved yeah. by another breathing being. Yeah. Um, and just really let in the, the, peace in that connection the ease in that connection the sweetness even if it's not your animal mm. you know your birds outside mm. to just start feeling another breathing being as something you can lean into for yeah. support yeah and it's absolutely great and wonderful to do all the self-regulating practices too yeah um, and a lot of us have to start there to start building some tolerance in our system for getting more resourced and grounded. Yeah. So that's a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Yeah. Even when, when you just mentioned the pet, I remembered when I um, first separated from my husband, my cat would come and lie down on my chest and purr. And that the vibration of that purr and the warmth of her soft little body was like it, like remembering it almost makes me cry. It was the yeah. most beautiful thing. And that the experience of going through that divorce was a time when I had to learn how to receive help from people in ways that I knew I wasn't going to be able to repay back in equal measure. Yeah. I just, I, I couldn't do it any mm -hmm. other way. No, you shouldn't have to either. <laughs> Being able to support you is probably the biggest gift in the world for people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's and a beautiful... I, mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, you had mentioned the thing about capacity earlier. Yeah. Of like, <clears throat> it's really, we're really talking about connecting with people who have the capacity yeah. for empathy and um, slowing down and really listening and just being with you instead of needing to fix it or figure it out yeah. or put the spotlight back on them. 
Yeah. And so that can take time to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, But once we get a few, they tend to grow exponentially. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be friends, family members, professionals, pets. But I know even I, I, you know, the, I also can think of people who like, I wouldn't really go to that person when I was really vulnerable because I know they're just going to try to fix it and make it go away. And that just makes me feel worse. (laughs) Yeah. I used to be a real, like really compulsive. Like I would choose unconsciously people without capacity over and over again. And then I thought it was I me, you know, I was too much. Mm -hmm. I was too broken. I was too, but that was part of what I learned how to do. growing up so of course then yeah. then I would keep doing that over and over until I woke up and was like oh I need some boundaries <laughs> yeah is that yeah. one of the things that you mean when you mentioned body memories yeah I mean I was thinking when our when we feel like our body's betraying us I'm just thinking out loud here but mm. I'm I just have to guess that we're experiencing a body memory most of the time mm. we're where our body is going, hey, there is something that has to do with my history that is not allowing me to really take in the present moment in the way, in a way that feels good or supportive mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. peaceful or at ease. Would you say so? Mm. Mm. And I, I also think that, I mean, I think factors like diet and exercise or or whatever, they do make a difference to the health of your body, but that there's a, the, the experiences that we've had in our lives show up in our bodies in ways that can look like illness, tension, injury, like there is a relationship there. I think that there's like a physical I kind of want to say physical manifestation doesn't necessarily mean that, well, if you have this kind of cancer, it means that this happened to you when you were a kid, but that, (laughs) that um, often if there's something in our bodies, that's not, that doesn't feel good. That's not, that doesn't feel like health, that there may be some, something an experience from earlier in our lives that's contributed to that. Do you think that's true? Totally. I'm so glad that you brought that in because I think that it can be absolutely both. It can be something totally related to right here and right now. But if it's something that's happening again and again, that's when I get curious. And I'm like, mm-hmm. eh. if it's not, if it's not moving through, there might be some piece of history here. Yeah. 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 I mean, for me, I, I'm just thinking like, okay, if I'm carrying that belief that my, I can't trust my body, my body gives me mixed messages. It, it won't be well when I want it to be well, mm-hmm. essentially <clears throat> I'm not trusting my foundation, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not trusting where I thrive. Right. And that's my history right? Mm -hmm. My foundation had a lot of cracks in it. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to trust that I could thrive, that I could um, rest into something that would support me. And then here I am with my body. I'm always pissed at it because in some way or another, uh, it's not supporting me in the way I want. So for me, that betrayal experience is totally a body memory of what Mm -hmm. I experienced when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I just want to take a moment of compassion for all of our bodies. <laughs> yeah. And have been through so much. Mm-hmm. Mm. 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 And I could keep talking to you for a very long time. <laughs> but <laughs> Um, I would love to hear about creating safer spaces and other ways that people can take in your wisdom 
And then I have another one last question for you. Cool. Yeah. I was just about to go science nerd on you. <laughs> oh, this is good. It's probably good. We can do more talking later. Yeah. Uh, my brain always goes, goes there when we talk about body memories of how, what the science is underneath all of that. And it's just so fun. <laughs> but it helps people to understand too, because it, it makes things kind of concrete. Like I, my, in my previous life, I was an engineer and there was a point in my life where I was like, I, re, I have a distinct memory of my friend talking about energy. And I was like, when you talk about energy, where on the electromagnetic spectrum are you talking about? Because if it's not on there, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Totally. I was just thinking, you know, like as a last thought, about the Bessel van der Kolk's book, which is titled mm -hmm. The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. When you had us like have that moment of acknowledgement for all of our bodies. And I was just like, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, the body definitely does keep the score both in mm -hmm. beautiful, positive, pleasant mm -hmm. ways and mm -hmm. things that are not so pleasant. It's like mm -hmm. all, everything we have lived through lives right here. We store it. Mm -hmm yeah like um we're like walking it's not exactly a library what's a better analogy of a museum or something something that's holding all of the records from our lives hmm. like uh what is that thing called in the library <laughs> i don't remember like an index something like I that yeah do you ever, do you remember, um, I, I remember when I, like in my library at school before, um, like computer catalogs were a thing, there would be these little index cards and you would like look up the index card with the topic and the names of the books were all, it was all very analog. Yeah, that <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been in a library, but yes. <laughs> Anyways, creating safer space is, it's actually creating safer space. space. And it is, it's one of my babies, one of my online courses on trauma awareness for coaches, mm -hmm. for therapists and facilitators. And it is my passion project, you know, and more and more lately, I've been talking about when we're trauma aware, it's not just for folks who carry trauma, really it's like human awareness. It mm -hmm. really helps us be able to connect on such a deeper level when we have this awareness. It helps us be more confident in ourselves. We're not tiptoeing, not trying to activate people or overwhelm them or harm them. We have this clarity around, oh, okay, I know exactly what to do here. I know what to look for. I know how to be, I know I get to make repairs all of this stuff. So <clears throat> I built a course that's actually really easy to go through. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge community now. Hundreds and hundreds of people are there. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of hundreds, I don't know how many. <laughs> and in April, we're going to start with six weeks of live calls. So people can go through the modules and they're all really bite-sized. So mm -hmm. they're easy to kind of understand and then incorporate right away. And then, um, the calls will be live with me. So you can bring all of your questions and explorations and excitements mm -hmm. for this work. And we'll do practices. We'll connect with the community. And there's also a Facebook group and it's ridiculously mm -hmm. affordable <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for a really good reason. I would love this to be in the hands of any care provider anywhere in the world at some point, mm -hmm. because it matters a lot to me that people feel safe enough to be present no matter what they carry from their history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people think they have the best end of intentions because they're kind people and nice people and um, <clears throat> good at their craft. But what I have found again and again is when we have this information, people can really receive what we're offering in an even deeper way because yeah. trauma is tricky. It's definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah. we need to know some things about it and everybody carries it. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's creating safer space. Yeah, I've, I've been through the course at least a couple of times. And what I love about the way that you um, 
that you share it is it's like the trauma awareness is embedded in the way that you deliver the information. So yeah. it's not, it's like, it. this is like a very meta thing, but it's like the, it's not just the information that's available in the course. It's like seeing the way that you offer it, seeing the way that you are on the live calls. And when, like, when you say that the, the modules are bite-sized, they really, it's not like hour long lectures. It's like very, you get the essence of it, but it doesn't feel like I've got to remember. It doesn't feel that kind of like heavy. My brain is spinning with all this information that I have to now digest and integrate. It feels very um, like elegantly goes to the heart of how do I be in a certain, how do I practice being in a way that's going to be spacious and make sense and be safe enough for all of us. Does that make sense? Yeah. I've been <laughs> wanting to pay someone to help me, to tell me how the course is because people are really <laughs> bad at writing feedback. Let's just, it's really beautiful to receive. I mean, I couldn't have a bigger intention than mm -hmm. like delivering it mm -hmm. uh, in the way that I'm teaching you all to do it. <laughs> So mm -hmm. thank you. That feels really mm -hmm. nice to receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, this round, you have four practice calls with people from the community who are facilitating. And and Belinda and I, Belinda's also been on this podcast a number of times. Belinda and I are doing two of those calls together in this round. So we'll be guiding um, some practices so that you can experience what it's like to be led in this way. Yeah, <clears throat> that's one thing that I love about it is that trauma awareness isn't one size fits all. It's like mm -hmm. we can bring it into each of our own modalities, into our own personalities. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love having you all because you all are trauma informed and you all deliver it in unique ways. And so mm -hmm. it's so fun to just get to see how each person expresses it. Yeah. 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 And I, I feel when I'm with people and it's not just when I'm with clients, it's when I'm even it, like my, my sight has changed so that when I'm with anyone in my life, even if it's like someone, you know, cuts me off in traffic or something, I can, there's like a different way of seeing and understanding what's going on that mm. makes a lot more space. Yeah. I mean, about and space. that's, that's the piece that's so important for me, for others to understand. It's not just about taking care of other people better. It's about taking care of ourselves better. And like, mm -hmm. when we're trauma aware, we burn out so much less as mm -hmm. care providers and coaches and mm -hmm. therapists, because we actually get space inside ourselves to be more ourselves when mm -hmm. we don't feel like we have to tiptoe around people. Yeah. 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 yeah so I'll make sure the links are in the episode description for that. Um, did you want to mention anything about fierce and tender? Sure. <clears throat> that is a new project. I am, I have one other project I'm working on right now. After that, I'm retiring. I swear. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, but I am always coming out with new ideas because I just love creating stuff and I love hanging mm -hmm. out with everybody who shows up. I, in all my spaces, I always say like, it feels like we're all just sitting around a living room, hanging out. Everybody mm -hmm. really seems to like each other a lot. And mm -hmm. for me, I just, I really enjoy facilitating, but it, there's so much richness and wisdom in everyone who shows up. And it's the same with Fierce and Tinder, which is um, a group I created for folks with chronic health issues where we learn about nervous system regulation because the more regulated our systems are, the more our immune systems function better. And um, it, it's all about connection as well. So mm -hmm. it's a place where we get to really share and be real with other people who struggle with chronic illness. And it's, it's developing right now. We're in our second month. It's still brand new. And so I already have some more ideas of how I can make it even 
more safe, even more held because I wanted to make it really simple Mm -hmm. where there's not a Facebook group. People feel pressure to show up Mm -hmm. for there's no homework. There's no big dashboard. You literally just show up for the calls every other week. And that's enough. Like, I don't want people to feel like they have to do more because I know people Mm. with chronic illness are all are working double and triple time, just trying to take care of themselves every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I'm just keep trying to figure out what practices to build in, what conversations, what pieces are the most supportive. So everyone feels like they can really be there and get something out of it. It's also very, very affordable. It's like $35 a month. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so yeah. I just want it to be enough for people to feel committed to show up, yeah. um, but not an added stress because folks with chronic illness really do um, take a lot, a lot of extra time taking care. And so I want mm-hmm. them to feel cared for. I want us yeah. to feel cared for. <laughs> yeah. 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 I honestly couldn't recommend your, your spaces anymore. Like I, it, they've really that spaciousness spaciousness and love is really the the feeling um of what it's like to be in your spaces Mm. I feel that way in your presence too (laughs) and here on your podcast so I think we're a really good fit (laughs) yeah thank you so my last question is if there was one thing that you would really love people to take away from this conversation, because we've talked about a lot of different things, but if there's one thing you would really love to hone in on for people, what would that be? Hmm. I mean, you're not alone Mm -hmm. and it can be really overwhelming to feel betrayed by our bodies or not Mm -hmm. feel like we can drop into our bodies for whatever we want in there healing wisdom pleasure connection and just to know that it is we all of our journeys are totally different from each other and some are faster and some are slower but every bit of the journey has information Mm -hmm. and when we can slow down enough to listen with some some part of us that can care Mm -hmm about what we hear (laughs) it'll give us a lot more space to be with what comes up Mm -hmm. yeah and I think for me the one thing I would love people to take away is to um you don't have to do any of it alone either that you deserve support and that the way we were designed was to be in connection with support from other human beings. And that is, that is how we're made. Mm. (laughs) Thank you, Shelby. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.